in the face! Thank you. Hello and welcome to Hey, Not the Face with your host, John Nash, and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today we have a topic that is so important for fighters that we're going to give you the entire thing for free. That's right, for free. But first, before we jump into that, and I'll let John tell you what the topic is, we're going to welcome back John because he has been away in France at a wedding. So we need to get the update of how much fun you had in Paris. Oh, well, thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Oh. Et, uh, et comment va tu? <gasps> Look at you. I don't have a clue what you said. I just made, that, I just made noises. That merci know. beaucoup. I know yeah, that je, part. Je peux parler uh, un peu au fond, uh, mais uh, mon français est très, mais uh, uh, je, je peux uh, pa, uh, dire uh, quelque chose. Con, well, forget it. I'm not going to keep going because my my accent is so thick and bad. It's it, For French speakers, it's just got to be like fingernails on a it's got to be quint from uh <laughs> jaws fingernails on a chalkboard <laughs> so tell me what's the topic of the day well while I was gone there there was a filing and that filing was the settlement the proposed settlement in the ufc class action antitrust case and so today what we're going to do is we are going to go over all the key information that i think fighters because several fighters have contacted me so i thought it'd be good to put it all in one place that can be easily heard and shared uh so we're going to go over stuff like what the calendar is like going forward uh what makes up the settlement who are members of the classes and how much they will receive from the settlement what they have to do to make sure they get their money that being the fighters and a look at the arbitration agreement and how that might impact many of the fighters that and a bunch of other stuff but that's the key old things we're going to go over today there you have it, the long and the short of it. So let's let's get right into it. A brief summary of the lawsuit and the allegations against the UFC. That's kind of what I need you to start off with. Back on December 16, 2014, a group of fighters filed a complaint in a San Jose courtroom. Those fighters were Kong Lee. Nate Corey and John Fitch. That's why the case is because uh, Kong Lee was the first name on it. That's why it's called Lee V. Zufa, the, the you know, parent company of the UFC. After which, uh, Cal Kingsbury, Brandon Vera, and Javier Vasquez added their name. And what they alleged is the UFC violated what's called Sher Section 2 of the Sherman Act. They intentionally tried to monopolize uh, the industry, right? The industry of mixed martial arts. But it wasn't monopoly. They were arguing, they were arguing the UFC did something called monopsony, the reverse of monopoly, where instead of being the only seller of a product, they're the only buyer, in this case, elite level MMA talent. Uh, so from 10 years after that, that date, almost 10 years now, we've reached a point where we have a settlement. Uh, we were on our way to trial, and then the two parties meant to have a settlement. Uh, and that settlement is what we are going to be talking about now. So how is that for a very brief encapsulation of the case? It was, Ten years covered in five sentences. It was fantastic. I loved it. <laughs> so let's get down to brass tacks then. What are the important events that still need to happen to make this official, this settlement? Well, they're going to have to schedule a hearing to have a preliminary approval. That's the key thing. And that's, I don't, we don't have an exact date yet, but they'll have a, a hearing for the uh, criminal, uh, the, the approval. When that happens, it should happen within a few weeks or so. And that the judge signs off, and all indications, the judge will probably sign off on this plan. If that happens, then we start going through a bunch of other events. Uh, 30 days after that approval, we'll have a settlement administrator uh, to provide direct mail notices to the settlement class. So fighters should expect 30, within 30 days to start getting contacted. Within 60 uh, days after that preliminary approval, uh, there will be motions for the, the attorney's fees. Uh, 75 days after the, that approval, settlement class members uh, will have a chance to submit any objections to the settlement class counsel's request for attorney fees uh, and you know other complaints. And then uh, within 21 days after the exclusion objection deadline, the last one I just said, 
then the, that's the last date that people will have a chance to contest the, the settlement from the outside. So fighters will have a chance. If you don't agree with it, you'll have a chance to file uh, to contest it. But I doubt many fighters will because basically they would have to then file their own suit File their own, get their own experts to go through it if they wanted to sue the UFC on, on, on a separate case. They didn't like the outcome on this. So those are the key dates coming down the pipe. Uh, that that'll be the events that fighters should pay attention for. Uh, but we will. There will be n- numerous, I'm sure, information coming out along the way. But the the I don't imagine much changing from what the settlement that's been put forward because both the plaintiffs and defendants have approved the settlement. What exactly? was the settlement like what what was the amount and what do the fighters get out of it and was was there any sort of injunctive relief at all well the what the settlement makes up is is the agreement is the settlement agreement provides for a cash payment totaling 335 million into a ufc settlement fund which will be for the benefit of the settlement classes so the fighters that are part of the class will be paid from that fund so all the fighters uh, will be paid from a $335 million sum. And then there will be some uh, prospective relief in the contracts. Uh, so there is some injunctive relief. Uh, we'll get to it later, but I don't think it's the the far-reaching injunctive relief that a lot of people were hoping for. Yeah, I just wanted to get out that there might have been something a little bit more than just the money. I have the, the weirdest question possible, but I have to ask it to you right now before it fleets from my brain. With this settlement and uh, everything, did they adjust at all for fighter purse inflation? Because doesn't it d- didn't it change dramatically from 2010 to now? Unfortunately, no. That's uh, one no. thing okay. about a, a class action lawsuit like this, an uh, antitrust case, is damages don't increase with inflation. I think we talked about an old show. I'm going to mention it briefly. So that's one of the bad things about a case dragging on. If you are suing for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in damages that took place in the past, when you win, the most you can get is that a hundred thousand dollars in damages. You know, uh-huh. if an antitrust case, they would have troubled it, but we never got to a trial. But yeah, so even so, the amount of money, uh, the three hundred thirty-five million, uh, we'll break it down later what party it is. But for the Lee class, the original guys. It would have been a much larger sum if this had been awarded years ago. Let's put it that way. Okay. okay. I mean, much larger in real dollars because the money has inflated since then and the dollar is not worth as much today as it was years ago. How much do the attorneys get? Well, the attorneys, this is what they're asking for. It doesn't mean what they're going to get. The judge has to approve, but they're asking for $11 million in, in expenses that they put out of pocket for the case. Um, and then a third of the, the the winnings, the settlement damages, a third to cover all basically all their attorney fees, all the hours. And, and they have a long list. They, they list all the work they did. And we're talking tens of thousands of hours of labor. The attorneys claim they did. And it's very possible. And so they're asking for a third of that. So if the judge agrees and gives them that full amount of what they're asking for, that would leave $215 million for the fighters. But it's possible because, as they point out, usually the uh, the judge has to agree to it. There's something called the lodestar method where they 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 kind of weigh how much work you actually did, and that the that the normal amount uh, that's awarded to attorneys are anywhere from twenty percent to thirty three and a third percent, thirty three percent max, right? A third. And they're asking for the max. So it's possible the judge does not grant them that max. But if he does, that would leave $215 million out of the $335 million for the fighters. If they had lost, would the attorneys still have charged them? If Let's say it went to oh. the, the, the hearing. I'm just no, curious. no. The, the attorneys were bearing the entire risk. Okay. The attorneys paid out $11 million to experts and other, and other uh, entities. And they were working basically for free the last 10 years multiple firms, multiple attorneys. I mean, we're talking, you know, I can't remember how many plus they had over a million pay, million pieces of documents they went through. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they're, we're talking again, tens and tens of thousands of hours of labor that they would not have been paid for if they had lost this case. Um, let's get to the classes. Tell us about those two classes. Well, there's two classes involved here. So people might remember the first one Lee filed back in 2014. 
because there's a four-year statute of limitations, that December 16, 2014 filing uh, works four years back. So the class starts on December 16, 2010, and it went until June 30th, 2017. So I'm going to read what the description is. For the Lee class, all persons who completed in one or more live professional UFC promoted MMA bout taking place or broadcast in the United States from December 16, 2010 through June 30th, 2017. Excluded from the Lee class are all persons who are not residents or citizens of the United States unless the UFC paid such person for competing in a bout fought in the United States. I'll have more of that on just a second. But then the Johnson settlement class is all persons who competed in one or more live professional UFC promoted MMA bout taking place or broadcast in the United States from July 1st, 2017 to the date of the preliminary approval of the settlement, which we haven't had yet. Excluded from the Johnson settlement class are all persons who are not residents or citizens of the United States unless the UFC paid such person for competing in about fought or broadcast in the United States. So that would cover basically everybody in the Johnson class. Uh, the Lee class, as you notice, it says it excludes non-residents or citizens. But I want to make a note of that. Eric Kramer, the lead attorney for the plaintiffs, was on Twitter, and he basically said because – the the uh, the Hal Singer, the expert, considered that a fight broadcast in the United States was the same as fighting in the UFC, the United States. That basically all the league class fighters that the international fighters that didn't fight in the UFC, the U.S. would be included. So everybody's covered. It seems like no one's excluded who fought in the UFC during that period, like we had thought before. So that should be good news for a lot of fighters, like from Ireland and Brazil, that didn't come to the U.S. to fight. Okay, so how are we splitting the settlement between those two classes? Well, they're going to split it 75-25 in favor of the Lee class. So of the two, if they get the $215 million, that means the Lee class would get $161.25 million to award to the fighters. And the Johnson class, the other class, would get $53.75 million. Why is the Lee class getting so much more? Well, there's multiple reasons. Uh, one is the Lee class was further along. They had passed uh, they had passed the hurdle of uh, class certification. The appeal process were on the cusp of uh, of a uh, trial. So that's one factor. The other factor is that the Lee class uh, basically been waiting longer. It's been going on longer. So it's they've been basically I guess you could say they've suffered more damages because of the delay. Uh, a third factor is that the UFC had changed their contract starting around 2017. And so there's a possibility that the Johnson class would show that they're not as damaged. We don't know because we haven't done it. They never did a discovery or regression models or anything about that. But the final, the primary reason, and they give this, the primary reason is a large number of fighters in the Johnson class signed an arbitration agreement. Uh, and that arbitration agreement was that you cannot sue, go to court for, with the UFC in a court over, over contracts. You had to go to an arbitrator, and it also waived the right to take part in a class action way in a class action. Since this is a class action, those fighters would probably be upheld by court. They said would be excluded are excluded from any class action. So a huge number, fifty five percent at least, perhaps more, because the the analysis was ended at a certain date, are excluded from taking part in a class action. So most Johnson fighters can't take part in a class action. And on top of that, because they can't take part, their damages are restricted. And, and it sounds like basically every fighter today in the UFC, almost every fighter, has signed this class action. So going forward, there will be no accruing, no additional damage. So in other words, the Johnson class had a much less likely chance to win and much fewer uh, potential litigants because so many people sign class action waivers. Let's talk about how this thing gets paid out. How do fighters in the league class, how are they going to get paid? How is that all formulated and calculated? Well, this is what they're going to do. They have, they've broken up in two parts, 75% going to the league class, and then they break it up in two tranches. The first tranche is 80% of the league class money, the 161.25 we're estimating right now. It could potentially go higher. Uh, 129 million of that is going to go to the first tranche. And this is going to be distributed on the basis of each league class claimant's prorata share of all event compensation earned during the league class period. So a simple way to calculate this, 
In fact, we'll use a fighter because we know his total earnings during the league class, Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor made $27 million for the, and during the league class period from 2010 to 2017. We know that because the, uh, the trial revealed that. So that $27 million would be about 4.85% of the total amount of earnings paid out in compensation during the league class period. So that means he'd get 4.85% of that $129 million. So uh, about $6 million would be going to him. So basically, that's how every fighter can calculate. In fact, another easy way is to combine all your income you made during the lead period as a fighter and, and take 22, around 22, 23% of that. That should be how much your compensation for that tranche will be. Then there, another 20% of the lead class, $32.25 million, is going to be distributed on the basis of each lead claimant's pro rata share of all the lead claimant's bouts fought during the class period. So there's roughly 3,000 fights that were fought during the class period. And so you divide that by the total, and that means a little over $5,000 is given to every fighter for every fight they had during the Lee class period from December 16, 2010 until June 30, 2017. So, you know, let's just magically make him invent a fighter who fought 10 times and made a million dollars. He would probably get, uh, you know, t- from the the uh, from the compensation portion, event compensation, he'd get around two hundred thirty thousand, and for his ten fights, he'd get another, you know, five thousand, fifty thousand, so two hundred eighty thousand, give or take, maybe up to close to three hundred thousand, would be his award, and this is after attorney fees, so that's how much he'd be awarded from the settlement. So guys like Donald Cerrone and Jim Miller are gonna clean up. Sort of. I mean, I don't know if they're going to describe clean up, but they should be pretty, do pretty decent, right? Being that they have so many fights between them. That's all I was looking at. They should, uh, they should, it should be a, it should be a sizable amount that'll be useful for most fighters. Exactly. The the other thing is, oh, sorry, I should point out too, that all the claimants, the minimum amount you can get paid. So if you only have one fight and you got paid, let's say $4,000 to show and you didn't win, the minimum amount is you get at least a minimum of eight thousand dollars as a settlement. So that's the minimum, but there's there's no maximum. And that was why I was asking the question about adjusting for inflation because yeah. wow, back then they were making four thousand dollars to show. Yeah, like, like it, I mean, it's disappointing in the sense that a lot of people I thought were hoping for huge amounts of some, you know, basically per permanent retirement money. But in many ways, this is like a really on steroids version of the California pension plan. So fighters will get a chunk, often multiples what they probably earned in the UFC for some of them. Because if you fought, if you didn't make much, but you fought, let's say, five times on a six and six or eight and eight contract back in the day, mm-hmm. it's possible that you will earn two, two to three times as much uh, based on this or not, maybe not three times, but two times as much what you made uh, on the, from the settlement than you did during your period from compensation for your boss from the UFC during that time. So, you know, it's, uh, again, I don't want to over exaggerate that it's like a tremendous, uh, windfall, but it is a, it's it, for most fighters, it should be a healthy, a, a much needed amount for many fighters. And unfortunately a few fighters because their careers ended, you know, before the class period or, you know, shortly thereafter, they are not going to get much compensation because they did not have the bouts during the class period. One more time, you know, I know you briefly touched on it, but one more time why the Lee class is getting so much more than the Johnson class. Well, the, the number one reason, uh, we can, the, the multiple reasons, basically because the Lee class is much further along. The Lee class is, uh, doesn't have the contract changes that they introduced for the Johnson. The Lee class uh, has been waiting so long. But the number one reason is because class action waivers were signed in the Johnson class. So that's why the Johnson class is getting a smaller amount. They're they're getting the uh, uh, they're getting fifty three point seven million seven five million total as their tranche, but it'll be broken up basically the same. Eighty percent of the Johnson settlement will go as a pro rata for all the event compensation. Twenty percent uh, will go on a pro rata version version of their their bouts. Uh, there are because of the arbitration waiver, there are fewer fighters who are part of the Johnson class and they are part of the Lee fewer fights. So I calculated, I am guessing they will get about 1500 per fight, uh, less than the Lee class, but still 1500 per fight. 
but there is a minimum uh, for the, the the Johnson class. Uh, we'll be a cap. To, I should notice too. The, the the cap on the Johnson class is that you cannot get more than ten percent of your total uh, event compensation during the 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 Johnson period, which is July first, two thousand seventeen, to now, or seven thousand dollars, whichever is higher. So that's the cap. For all the fighters, though, that's our that that's for the fighters though in the Johnson class that did not sign the arbitration agreement. So for the minority of fighters in the Johnson class, the forty to forty five percent that don't have that uh, arbitration agreement, that's what they get. The other fighters, all the fighters that signed the arbitration clause or class action waiver uh, in the Johnson class, they are just going to get one flat five thousand dollars, regardless of how much they earned or how many fights they had during the Johnson period. Well, that seems a little unfair. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it stinks. Uh, it's very unfair. The problem is that the these fighters that sign these waivers have no right to take place in a class action waiver. So the or take part in a class action. So when they settled, they basically were not calculated into the settlement. They 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 could not the the attorneys could not use them as leverage to get more out of the Zufa. And so, really, they're paying them out of the amount that they were going to pay all the other fighters. John, why did they settle? Well, they settled uh, for numerous reasons. One is probably because of the uh, the arbitration agreements. So, I think that's one of the major reasons. Uh, the that's probably the primary reason. I mean, they they write about it in the in their filings. They talk about how hard it was going to be to win. Um, because I shouldn't say they're talking about, they're very competent in their case, they claim. But one problem is you're always worried about one juror because you need to get all eight jurors to be unanimous. So you're always worried about one juror, uh, voting against you. Right. And so that's, that's always a concern. So then you can't win. It's a, you have to retrial or whatever, but that's one concern. And the other concern is, uh, they didn't have the leverage from what's called injunctive relief. We'll get in that later. They did. They they could not ask the court when they, if they went to trial to to go and examine the UFC's contracts and order changes if they win, and that's that was the huge cudgel that the UFC was facing. Right, that's the big fear the UFC had that they not just damages but that they would be forced to change their contracts. Without that fear, uh, the UFC was not going to offer as big a settlement. And then on top of that. The current Johnson class, the current class is not accruing any more damages because everybody signed waivers. And so you're asking the attorneys to put up tens of millions of dollars of experts and their own labor and get basically nothing back because the damages have already been done. There, there's no additional damage accruing them for to keep litigating this case. So for those reasons is why they decided to settle. They didn't want to face years and years longer to try to get injunctive relief. Uh, and for a case, the Johnson case, of which they couldn't get any more damages for. Let's talk about named plaintiffs. How much are they getting? And refresh everyone, what's a named plaintiff? The second half of this episode will be available on Thursday. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. Ow! Ow! Not the face! Ooh! Ooh! Okay, the face!